Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining us today, 2022 world champion, Commonwealth Games champion, and European champion in the 50-meter freestyle, we're sitting down with Ben Proud. Coming to us from Turkey, Ben, how's it going? All good, thanks, Coleman. Yeah, good to join you guys, and yeah. training at, at Gloria Sports Arena right now in Turkey. Um, just what what is the training setup like for you right now? Do you have a coach? Do you have a team you're training with? And and what makes Gloria such a great place to train for you? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I trained in Gloria for four years, um, 2017 to 2020, um, back with the Energy Standard Group, and that got closed down. Um, but I made the move back here in April uh, by myself. Um, I had to go through a few changes and decided that, you know, Gloria was my, my happy place and it's somewhere I can go to, to train, train well. Um, so yeah, I'll be back in April primarily to train with Marco Coso, uh, my gym coach. Um, he's still based here and, you know, I thought, uh, for me, for my event and the way I train, I need someone who can really take control of my gym. Um, so I've moved back to here. Uh, he's taken full control of that and. On the swimming side, it's, it's, it's a bit different. Um, I'm somewhat coaching myself. Uh, James Gibson's back on board, a bit of a coaching mentor. He, he guides me um, in all sorts of aspects. And if he's here, he'll coach me, um, but not quite full time. So, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit, a little bit different, but it got me the summer last year and um, seems to be working. So I've got plenty of changes to make this year, um, which we'll see. Someone, I... I uh... I was talking to someone the other day. Um, I forget who, but they were like, yeah, Ben is like a full-time weight coach. And then a part-time, so like that's, that's what he needs in a, a part-time swim coach. And that's what he needs to kind of get his groove going. Um, how, how have you found that balance of swim and gym and the emphasis on each that works for you? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this goes back years into my swimming career and um, back into like 2012, 2013. Um, I've always been a 50 uh, specialist in mind. Um, I've done the hundred in the past because I have to do some relays, but you know, deep down I was always the 50 meters and one, one route to get to, um, to where we wanted to get was to emphasize the gym, uh, control the strength, get stronger and bigger. Um, almost looking up to Florent Manadou, big guy, strong guy. Um, and so that's kind of the route we took and it's, it's worked and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's paid its dividends over the years and more recently, um, yeah, it kind of comes down to gym is very important in my, in my training. Like I think a lot of people know that I don't do much yardage in the water. Um, seven to 14 K a week, I think is, is my, my average. So it's, it's really not that much. Um, but the key thing is keeping the, gym consistent and you know gradual over the year and Marco very much takes very good control of that and makes sure everything's balanced and we're not you know working too hard we're not too working too easy um so it's kind of like a yeah I mean gym is is my thing to get me to where I want to be um but I don't have the mind to understand what you need to do it's a lot more science-based and a lot more numbers-based um and that's something I just I, I can't do for myself so hand it over to someone who takes good control. Yeah. Does Marco have a background in swimming or working with aquatic athletes at all? Well, I, th- I think um, he's a very smart man. And I think when he started working with Energy Standard um, back in maybe 2015, I think that was kind of his first introduction to swimming. Um, so he's he's learned a lot since then. And when I worked with him in 2017, we... We bonded really well. We we were very much like minded in the way we want to do things and developed a kind of system that works. And I know myself very well. Marco knows the gym, and he knows me very well. That he can manage things quite quite easily. Um, but I think it's one of these things. Like if you're committed and you're willing to learn and adapt and change things as you go, then you know you can learn things pretty easily. So. 
So on that note, let's, let's kind of walk through this summer. Um, you said you moved back to glory in April and then you had world championships in June. Uh, so what was the preparation like making that move back to Turkey and then only having, I don't know, let, let me probably less than two months or, yeah. or two months to get ready for the big meet of the summer or one of them at least. Yeah. I mean, this kind of, um, like last year was a very strange year. There was, uh, the disappointment from the Olympics, you know, I, I didn't perform nearly as well as I would have hoped. And it was really quite a, you know, quite a heart, heartbreak, quite emotional, um, threw me into quite a bad place. And then through all this kind of, we did ISL and, and world short course, which was, it went really well, but, you know, I was still trying to battle these demons. Um, and it kind of got to this point where like I was considering retirement and I was, you know, unsure if I want to carry on swimming for a couple of months. And I, I took a big step back from swimming. I, I was, you know, doing very, very little, um, just enough to kind of come in, you know, once a day or something, do something to keep me taking over. But, you know, I wasn't, wasn't planning on uh, staying much longer. Um, but it got to the point where I kind of realized, you know, swimming swimming is a love hate love hate sport and i think everyone who watches this if they're a swimmer they can they can understand that sort of relationship like it's we love it but there's times where it's pretty tough pretty brutal um so from my head it was kind of like i have to get back to the stage where it's more love than hate and to me that was moving back to gloria where i'm happy i'm i'm comfortable but also bringing things from the past so the things I did when I started swimming, you know, things I did with John Rudd, with James Gibson, like the things that really worked, I just brought these back in. And it was more the case of, I wasn't thinking performance. You know, I, I couldn't, couldn't care about the medals this summer. Like I, I did want to perform at the Commonwealth Games, but all the other events, I was more like, I'll do it because it's experience and hopefully it'll be a fun summer. But performance is completely out of the equation. And I think that was probably the best thing because rather than any pressure on the back, it was more do things because I enjoy it and, and have fun in the water, appreciate the water. And there was no real plan. Like we, we had vague training sessions. We, we adapted things quite well. But so when we got to World Champs and the times were pretty good, that was quite a surprise. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was no real emphasis on yes we have to perform but this is this is why i look back at it and it was such a good time because there's no pressure me and marco were working really well together and just you know going with the flow and it provided great results and probably something i can learn from for sure yeah what um mm -hmm. oh sorry if uh oh sorry what what were what were those things that you brought back from your, your beginning of swimming, things you did with John, things you did with James. Um, do you have examples of some of those? Yeah, I mean, these are like technical things that like small sections of sessions. Actually, one of the key things that brought back my enjoyment for the sport was something that I did back in Malaysia with my first coach, um, which was we were very much working on the fly and we, we had to um, almost, you know, really work on the details. So it's doing things like, you know, you swim a 50 fly, uh, no equipment, just completely natural, but you try to get the lowest stroke count possible and you, you glide between each stroke and you just, you really feel the water, be with the water. And you try to get yourself down to kind of four or five strokes uh, per length, which, you know, there's a lot of gliding in that, but it's really about feeling the water, catching the water. And these things like I, I just really enjoyed when I was, when I was doing it before and I hadn't been able to do it for a long time. So I've Brought, the, brought it back a couple of times a week just to you know get a better feeling of the water and these things just kind of evo evolved and led on to different sessions and you know i was more in the moment when i was swimming rather than thinking about external things i was more um, present you know doing things for a reason and yeah i think that kind of allowed me to develop my stroke a bit better uh, you mentioned Malaysia. You were born in Malaysia, I'm pretty sure, and you, you certainly grew up there uh, until I think you were an early teenager. Um, mm. 
what what we're having lived in the UK now, obviously living in Turkey now, uh, what were some of the things that stood out to you just as cultural differences or things you even liked from growing up in Malaysia? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a beautiful place. Um, and I, I, so I moved there five months old. I was there until I was 17. So the majority of my childhood was, was based out there. And, you know, living there as a kid was amazing. And, you know, the variety of cultures, you know, the, the food, the weather, the experiences, um, all made for a really good childhood. Um, but actually, I think it really helped me become a sprinter because I started swimming quite late. I wasn't until I was 15 that I started training properly. Um, before that, I was doing maybe two or three sessions a week with the school team. Um, but it really was quite quite a late start. But before that, it was playing in the water, playing with friends, uh, playing games of catch and tag and stuff like this. And things that require like a quick burst of energy, quick burst of speed um, in and around the water. So in a natural way, I kind of think that developed my sprint from an early age in a way. So that when I did come back to UK, which, you know, UK is brilliant for uh, mid distance or 200 freestylers, you know, we've produced some of the best, best guys in the world. And there is a system in place in the UK that kind of produces these very talented swimmers, but there is no system in place to develop talented sprinters. Um, so I think if I was brought up in the UK, it would have been, my swimming career would have looked completely different. Um, so it kind of, you know, worked very well, the, the lifestyle I had to develop myself as a swimmer and as a sprinter. Did you grow up coming or visiting the UK? Yeah, like once once every year or two, and uh, not okay. too much, not too much. Okay. So what inspired that move back when you finally did come when you were 17? Yeah, it was purely for swimming. Uh, I mm -hmm. think we had, I, I was working with a coach out there and, we had done about a year and a half of work and, you know, made some good, good improvements. But, and at the end of that kind of chunk of time, there was a split in the road where either I stay in Malaysia and, you know, continue on with my life as it was, as it was planned, or I make this really bold move and commit myself to a career of swimming and, you know, dive head, head first into uh, a new program in Plymouth with John Rudd and, you know, see where swimming takes me. And it's kind of like I got this ball and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to run with it and see where it goes. And and as soon as I left Malaysia, it was kind of being full on swimming takes priority and, you know, I'm, I'm doing it for a reason. Do you still have family in Malaysia? Do you ever go back? Yeah. So I, I spent the summer there. Um, my dad's still there after 27 years. Um, wow. Still, still very much home. Like I, I would love to call it home um, mm. whenever I can. So, do you think you'll end up back there at any point? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Like as a child, it was it was a brilliant lifestyle. Um, as a swimmer, like I I know what I need and I know what I need to do. And you know that draw hasn't come back to me just yet. But you know, it, for, forever it will be my home. And I think that's probably enough enough for now. Definitely. Okay. So so mm -hmm. uh, bringing it back to World Championships. Yeah. Um, you're, you're going there for, again, the experience, you don't have a lot of performance goals, but getting into a 50 free final at a world championships, how, how do you balance or, or how do you stay in that mindset of, I'm just here for the experience. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to perform when it's like I could win a world title. Yeah. I mean, this is the, this is kind of the battle I had with the 50 fly. Um, you know, I was, I started with 50 fly and it was all going quite well. And I qualified first for the final. So all of a sudden I'm thinking like, okay, we, we came here for fun. Now we're going through first, but you know, a new Dressel uh, was in form. He was going to go much faster and that was, that was clear, but that was a shot to be on the podium. Um, so I, I went through a bit of a mental battle, like trying to get my head in the right place and then had a very bad race in the final. So that was all, <laughs> that was all gone before it even started. Um, and then, yeah, and then it was just a very strange, strange thing because then Dressel pulls out of the competition. It leaves a very open field for the 50, 53. And it was, yeah, it was a strange, strange time because, you know, and then as we went through in the final, 
you know, Bruno missed out, Flo missed out, and it was very different. Um, all of a sudden, top three guys from the Olympics on the podium, all of them right out, out of the equation. So, yeah, it went from, uh, and actually, so before the 53 begun, my, my only ambition and my only goal, which I was fairly stressed about, was making sure I made it to the final to secure my funding for next year. Uh, within the British swimming ranks, we have to do certain things to qualify ourselves for funding. So that was my only real specific goal. Everything else is just, you know, enjoy it. Um, but then obviously we go through and, and everything changes. You know, the most consistent swimmers in the world are missing out of the finals. And, um, and yeah, then suddenly there's a shot to, to win it. And it's one of these things, like it's an opportunity that if, if you didn't take it then, when else would it come? Um, because to me, I still believe Dressel is the fastest swimmer in the world, the best sprinter in the world, and you know the clear winner um, in all these races. So you take him out of the equation; it's kind of open, and it was a it was a very bizarre, bizarre feeling behind the behind the um, behind the deck. Um, all the swimmers kind of knew it was a bit more open, and there was an opportunity. But yeah, I just think I was very lucky to be swimming well and have done that performance at a time when it could win me that gold medal. So do you did you think uh coming into this meet that you had a 213 in you? No, no. I mean racing at the Marinostrum before, about a month before, kind of hinted more towards a 215, maybe a, a 214 at a push. Um but it was just, you know, everything we did in terms of the lead up and the taper and the preparation, it all worked very well to kind of give you that extra little boost in a way. Um, so I think I went 21-4 in the, in the semis, which for me was a very, very good race. Um, so I wasn't sure if I'd be able to find that a little bit more. And if I hadn't found, you know, a fraction more, then the gold would have gone to Michael Andrews um, because he he stepped up and saw a brilliant swim in the final as well um so it was, it was all very much a matter of you know being i think just being there in the moment like i think historically i had i tend to perform uh subpar at these big competitions um and you know i think i saw a stat that this is only the second time in the 53 that i had some faster in the final which to me is quite bizarre because that's not what uh <laughs> It's not what you're supposed to do. I think the only other time was 2017 um, World Champs. Um, then apart from that, every every other final had some slower. So yeah, I mean that was quite a, quite a nice learning curve to be able to you know go in go into the race as in lane four and still be able to step it up and and go faster. So that to me was a big big thing to learn from. Yeah, um, that's a surprising thing to hear especially from someone who is multiple time world champion, European champion, Commonwealth champion. I mean, like you've, you've been winning titles at these meets, uh, medals of all colors for the last eight years, I think <laughs> easily. Um, so that's, I, I didn't expect to, to hear that. Um, but the, it, it is cool to, like you said, have this learning curve where you're still moving through the sport and and picking up new knowledge along the way even even as as a veteran of the sport who's been doing it for a really long time moving on to the com games mm -hmm. you have five or six five or six weeks in between like mm -hmm. you said this was more of a you had more of a performance goal it was a home games it was in birmingham um so what was what was the double taper like for you <laughs> yeah this was um this was a new experience because I've been saying for a long time that Commonwealth Games is my priority. Um, it was, you know, for me, that, and I don't know if everyone knows this about the Commonwealth Games, but it's a bit more of a less competition, but more prestigiousness. So there's more, there's more value behind gold medal at Commonwealth Games and surprised me at World Champs. Um, not for us as swimmers, but for the, for the public. And for me, this was my third time coming back and retaining the title for the third time. Um, there was also a bit of a thing with the 50 fly that I was disqualified in 2018. 
So I wanted to come back and retain that title eight years on. Um, and I've been saying this for, for you know, three, four years uh, since 2018. So there was a lot of pressure on my back. And this was the only thing that was kind of keeping me in the water was I need to get to the Commonwealth Games and try to win to do this, finish off my legacy, and, and then I can see what happens. So there was a lot more pressure leading into that Games, but we just had to take it step by step. And, you know, coming back off the back of World Champs, you know, coming home with the gold medal when we weren't expecting too much, kind of threw things into a bit more of a, uh, a turbulent place, you know, high emotions, you know, your mind starts going different places. You start thinking, okay, I have to perform now. Um, I have to do well. But yeah, I think we just kind of managed to calm things down, build things back up and just get us to a place where physically the body is in a good position to go again. So it was all about recovery and keeping the top end speed there. And, um, but yeah, I mean, double tapers are hard. Like I, I should probably come to America and figure out how everyone does it there. Cause it's a, uh, it takes a special, yeah, special skill to obviously do two back to back meets and get faster as you go through. Um, but one thing I would say was my, this year, especially because I've been such, you know, on and off in swimming, my endurance from race to race was really quite shocking. Um, in the race as well was quite bad because I get to 35, 40 meters and my body just starts shutting down. I just don't have that capacity to hold on to that top end speed. And that was all due to, you know, maybe a lack of training or, you know, not, not having the right conditioning, um, which takes, you know, a couple of months to really make sure it's there. And also these back to back races weren't, wasn't really factored into my training schedule. Um, so when I was racing Commonwealth games, it was much harder to, um, swim multiple races, do the whole things you have to do around village living, you know, all walking, traveling. Um, so that was quite a physically enduring, physically tough, uh, process to go through that, which is why I had to play the game of, you know, breathing the heats or switching off in the semis just to save a little bit of energy so that in the final I could perform my best um, without that physical, yeah, without burning too much too, uh, too soon. Yeah. Is there, like you said, there's a couple months where it, that it takes to condition your body to get to a place where you can finish your races properly. Do you have an, an aerobic training chunk um of your training or what is what is that conditioning process for you look like so my aerobic conditioning is about two weeks at the start of each season uh, it's not not much at all um we do a little bit amongst the warm-ups you know throughout the year um but i don't do much aerobic work um but it's more of the speed endurance so it's about holding you know top end speed so we we would do a session uh, with James, which would be about 60, 25s. And you would do one, you know, all out top end speed, uh, two aerobic, and then one easy. And you just repeat this process over and over again um, until you complete, you know, 45 to 60 of these um, 25s. And this gives you the ability to hold the form and technique and stop your body from shutting down. Um, because in a, in a 21 second race, it's, it's not you're using the free energy system, the, the phosphocreatine system for about 35 meters of that race, the first 12 seconds. So you don't switch into that anaerobic source until the last 10, 15 meters. And that's really the bit that I have to work on to allow myself to hold on to that speed. Um, because the, the first 35 is pretty, um, not easy, but it's, uh, it's free energy. So you can just, get in and do it. But, um, but I didn't have that, that background of work, um, in the kind of January to, to March period where we usually have it, um, because I was going through a few things. Um, so that's kind of a thought from this year is, you know, we have to put in some more work and, and see how we can change things and, and adapt and see what it does to the actual race, um, for this year. For that set of 60, 25s, again, mm -hmm. you said, one top speed, two aerobic, one easy. 
Yeah. What's the focus of the, you know, what, what's the key to, to getting the most out of that set? It is, is it mm. holding that technique through all of the different speeds? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the key thing is the, the 25s at top end speed, you know, you, you really have to hit it as hard as you can. The aerobic element is more of a active recovery um, to make sure that you're flushing out everything you have to. And, and the easy one is just to switch off and get ready for the next uh, harder effort um but typically you find over the course of the whole you know 30 40 minutes when you're doing this is your body finds this equilibrium of producing lactate but also flushing it out so you kind of find this middle ground which is really it's painful to work in like it's it's quite tough uh, for me especially um but it allows you to almost factor in this neurological adaptation so you're always working at speed and your body is getting used to all this um, going on. Um, and you find yourself, you're tired, so you want to slow down, but you're also fresh enough that you can hold on to these uh, quite fast swimmers. And we would do this you know, every, every week uh, for a big chunk of time and just progressively move those, uh, those swims on. So if you, if you can do... 10 or 15 at a good pace then you start dropping off then you tend to find you know a couple of weeks later you can do more like 20 before you start really uh struggling um so nice yeah. that's that that's fascinating uh i <laughs> i just like hearing about different people's trainings but um thank you for explaining that thank you for diving into that um <laughs> so so calm games you defend both the titles or, or you get both the titles. Um, how do you walk away from that meet feeling? Yeah. I mean, that was the whole, whole experience was really like picture perfect. It was a home crowd. It was, you know, swimming good times in the finals, um, sharing it with good teammates. And, you know, it's a very friendly experience. Um, so in terms of like a competition, it was kind of, you know, we hit the nail on the head. It was, brilliant experience for me it kind of it closed the loop on quite a few things and like I, I felt like I had to finish this Commonwealth Games off um well to kind of put a neat end to my career um not saying that I'm retiring anytime soon but it kind of lets me finish this uh this block of work um over the past eight years and and be happy with it um but at this point we had probably already decided that we're going to swim at Europeans. Um, so I knew in the back of my mind that there was another, another race coming. And that was, yeah, that kept me kind of, kept me on my toes and kept me, um, yeah, thinking further ahead. Uh, for you personally, why even swim at Europeans for just where you were at physically, mentally, again, you kind of, the calm games, Put the bow on it it went picture perfect uh why swim at europeans for you uh because i think i was given a very unique opportunity uh by winning that gold at world champs it put me in a position where i could do something that i personally have never done before um which is kind of not dominating but it's owning a specific race for a certain amount of time um, and in my head I the short course season went very well like uh, we won ISL uh, I managed to get the gold at world short course and then the gold at world champs came and then Commonwealth Games came and I, I just thought you know what better way to finish off the season than to go to Europeans and try to try to win another title within a two-month block and you know just see what happens and it was there was no losing for me if i had come second you know it wouldn't have been the fairy tale ending but it would have still been a good achievement after a nice year and also i kind of want to see um the pool at rome i wanted to see it dressed up and, and looking good because it's one of my favorite pools and i was looking forward to going back and because it hasn't been in a proper event since 2009 so i thought it could be good fun to go there and and yeah just be part of it but the main ambition was to kind of do something different and win all three titles uh, within that time frame yeah 
Uh, I, I don't think I've talked to a single swimmer who has swam in that pool in Rome and not mm -hmm. said it's one of my favorite pools. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm dying to go to that venue one day, but so you, you go to euros, mm -hmm. you, you snag gold by two one hundredths of a second. Um, and then just like you said, how did it feel afterwards to have accomplished something that no one, let alone yourself, has ever done before in a single summer? I mean, it was it was such a relief because the actual the racing experience was I had swum the semi-final and I remember saying to James before the race, like, I I have to go for this in the semi-final. I just have to get that confidence boost um, to see that I'm still in relatively good form because physically and mentally I was just exhausted I was completely wiped out and even James said to me after like he was just he was just trying to nudge me along to, <laughs> to get me to the start line and just you know see how things go so I knew after the semi-final that I produced a, a good time I think it was 21-4 but that was all I had um, that was a, a perfect swim um, for my ability then so in the actual final I could feel myself suffering and and my body wasn't quite there um but then to get the win was a massive relief because there was a bit of a build up to it it was you know i was entered so therefore um people knew that i was going there to try and try and get another win um but there were also a lot of fast swimmers who were who were there and, and ready to pounce so it was more of a just a matter of, of relief and you know even though the final swim was a chunk slower in the semi-final to me that was just that was enough to to get my hand on the wall and and to walk away with that summer and this year kind of completed um so yeah i mean the whole summer just went better than i could have asked for you know ticked all the boxes and yeah walked away with those medals so it was a very special summer for me yeah uh, so congratulations first of all that's that's a that's a really <laughs> cool accomplishment um, Thank you. yeah, I, I'd have a few questions. Uh, something I'm curious about is mm -hmm. you kind of alluded earlier, the British swimming system kind of produces a lot of mid distance swimmers and they have a system for it. Um, mm -hmm. it seems like you, the way you move about swimming, the way you, you approach it, especially swimming the, in the events you do kind of being this pure sprinter, um, there's an amount of solitude that comes with it and and you have a lot of independence and it seems like you move through it alone a lot. Um, do you feel like you're someone who is fairly independent or someone who uh, appreciates and values kind of that solitude, especially when you go to these bigger meets and you're with team Britain? Yeah. I mean, so this kind of goes to my personality. Like I am a clear introvert, um, always have been. And even before I moved to England, when I started swimming, I, I, I said to myself, like, I'm not going to be one of these um, pumped up sprinters who, you know, it's just pure adrenaline and, and, you know, celebrating everything. To me, it's more the mental game as to how, how do you control your mind and your thoughts and your ambitions to almost lead your uh, career. Um, so I've always been about uh, goal setting, setting very specific targets and dreams and, and a lot of visualizing. And almost using the mind to, to help you progress along. Um, a bit like uh, sort of weight surfing in a way, or um, when you have a big parachute and it pulls you along, that parachute is, is your ambition and, and it uses you to catch you and, and pull you along and it makes things much easier. Um, but I have taken a very different route from a lot of people and I've had to almost craft my own way um, being a sprinter, being an introvert, um, I've had to make things work for me. And maybe that's why it's taken a little bit longer for me to find my comfortable place within the swimming world, because I'm, I'm not one to, to jump about and, and, and be loud in, in front of the TV type of thing. Um, but I just, I just, I love swimming. I think the 50 freestyle especially is a, a very special event, um, fastest man in water. But I think for a long time, there's been a gap in the market. You know, not many people have invested themselves to the greater extent to be able to craft a, a 50 meters freestyle, which is really technically perfect. Um, Dressel is one person that has probably the, the best chance of doing so. You know, he's a phenomenal swimmer to the extent where I, I 
I can't figure out how he does it type thing. But, you know, I think for me, my, my, my passion, my belief, I think there's an opportunity to um, do something special in the 50 and almost swim it in a way that is special. So for me, I'm not doing it for British swimming. I'm not doing it for um, any other purpose rather than I love the event. I love the sports. And I think there's a opportunity to, to do something special. Where do you feel like your ambition is taking you moving forward? So you mentioned this, this special 50 freestyle. I'm going to couple this with this world. We saw the 100 freestyle world record go down this summer. Same man says our CLO holds the 50 free world record. Um, in your mind, does this special 50 free line up with breaking that world record or are those two things disconnected? I mean, they're disconnected, but you know, the world record isn't necessarily a barrier. It's a, it's a brilliant swim done a long time ago. And unfortunately the super suits aren't around anymore. So there has to be a new outlook and almost a more intense, uh, approach to the 50 um as to all events i think Dr. david popovich is how he did it was phenomenal um and i think that world record will go um i'm not saying i'm gonna be the one to take it but you know eventually it will come down um but for me it's more about the whole process of start to finish like are all the angles right are you catching the water in the right way are you producing enough energy uh, throughout the whole race so i think technically I won't be content until I have Swamis 50, which to me is technically perfect. And that's kind of my ambition. Um, Time-wise, what it looks like, I, I don't know. You know, it's been a long time since I've been around that 21-1 uh, mark. It's been four or five years. Um, but I'm excited to kind of focus in and almost analyze this 50 in, in a very intense way and try to produce something that to me will be... Um, good enough in a way. So to finish out this podcast, uh, we, I asked Instagram what they wanted to hear from you or what questions they'd like answered. So I've got a few from there. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm curious. You've, I know you've swam short course. I know you've swam long course. Have you ever swam yards? No, I, we did one training camp in Florida, uh, back in 2016, 2015. Mm-hmm. And that was the only time I trained short course yards, but you know, my tumble turns are pretty shoddy, so I have never given it a go. <laughs> is, that, is that something you'd ever, you think you'd ever do? Would you ever come come to a yards meet in America? Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be fun. Um, I think it, I think the American system, like everyone develops amazing short course yards. I think I'd be leagues behind, but I think in terms of racing experience, yeah, it could be good fun. I'll definitely give it a shot, but it's just finding the right time sure uh well we'd love to see you here so (laughs) just if you ever come let us know we'll be there um next uh underwaters are underwater something you train specifically put an emphasis on you know have have in a race plan for the 50 fly or 50 free yeah i mean we we dedicate an entire session to underwaters uh, every week um we do a lot of work with fins uh against resistance um, because even though I only do six or seven kicks uh, off the start, that first 15 meters is, is 33% of my race. Um, so it's just as important. And historically, you've seen that the best best 50s come from you know extending it underwater as much as you can, um, so long as it's maintaining speed. Um, so for me, I try to extend my underwaters a bit more, um, try to get as much out of the, each kick, to allow myself the energy at the back end of the race. Um, but we do, we do a lot of work. Even I'm contemplating trying uh, fin swimming um, at some point, just, just for fun. I think we, why not give it a go? <laughs> fin swimming, meaning like uh, you put on a mono fin and you compete in underwater races, right? There is that, but there's also by swim, by fins. Uh, so you get two fins, swim in normal race, but you have to wear a snorkel and the dive's a little bit different, but you know, in terms of practicing and experience and, you know, different stuff, it's, it could be fun. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> Please yeah. let us know if you do that as well. <laughs> yeah. That sounds great. Um, uh, in terms of diet, 
mm-hmm. are how how strict are you on what you're consuming on a day to day basis, especially some something like right now where you're training and you're also at Gloria, which is you know ha- has its own food situation. Yeah, uh, I'm not strict at all. Um, I in the past I've done a lot of research into sports nutrition, and it's kind of what I wanted to study for a while. Um, but I I listen to my body in the sense that our bodies are very smart they understand what they need and what they don't need and if you listen to your cravings you can kind of get a good understanding as to what your body needs um, in terms of nutrients or or calories uh, i don't enjoy uh, fast food or fried food or oily food so that's all kind of out of my diet um i like things to be a little bit cleaner but at the same time i have to eat a lot because my uh, um, my natural tendency is to become quite skinny um i lose lose fat i lose muscle very very quickly so therefore i have to keep my nutrition quite high um but i enjoy good food so it makes it easy do you have a favorite kind of food or a meal? Yeah, I mean, malaysia especially was amazing for all sorts of foods um i do i do love my uh, sushi my japanese um but also my chinese only if it's from from malaysia um but yeah, I mean, I'm typical swimmer. Pizza pasta is ideal as well. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm sure you enjoyed Naples then for, for, for ISL. <laughs> that's, that's six weeks. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you mentioned uh, you're a naturally skinny, but on pool deck at most meets, you're one of the most, you're one of the buffest swimmers uh, on deck. We got a lot of comments about that. <laughs> Just ask uh, people asking us to ask you how you're so buff, but I am curious mm-hmm. when you're working in the gym, um, how much of it is just purely trying to build strength or muscle versus trying to build mobility or flexibility? Yeah. So it's a big, um, if I flash back to 2016, which was heading into Olympics that time, there was a big push to put on. Uh, some weight um primarily focusing on the 50s so we tried to put on about two kilos of muscle um so we did a lot of hypertrophy work to to get that kind of growth um since then it's never been about trying to get bigger it's more about getting functional muscle um so it's kind of using the muscles to making sure they're as, as strong as possible and as powerful as possible because um Swimming is always a power to weight ratio sport, but also with 50, you can be heavier so long as you've got the strength. So there's been, you know, we've allowed ourselves to push on the weight and the, and the muscle a little bit more. Um, but I think it just comes down to my specific training in the pool and in the gym, because I don't need to do much aerobic work. I don't need to do many meters, um, which means I can quite easily keep the muscle mass on even at hard training. Um, but then as well, the good thing about working with Marco is he's got a very fundamental understanding of the body and, and people. So we, yes, we get strong and, and fast and conditioned in the weight room, but we have to almost counter that with all the mobility, functional work and, you know, uh, flexibility. So we do more work on that sense than we do in the strength, strength gym. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, I was curious about kind of that balance. Uh, yeah. just, and then in terms of the pool, I have to ask, you mentioned a typical training week for you is seven to 14 K. Um, what does that look like in terms of how many times you're in the water and mm-hmm. specifically what you're doing in the water? I know you mentioned you have an underwater practice once a week. Yeah. I mean, it might be surprising, but I do 10 sessions in the water, uh, each week. Um, but those 10 sessions, they, they will never go above, uh, 2k. Um, some of them are as low as 400 meters, um, post gym. Um, so really, really low yardage, but they're, I mean, they're, they're quite consistent. They're all about, uh, I mean, every session is different. Um, all have a warm up. Uh, some are purely, uh, physiological based. So, you know, fifties with fins, um, all out or the sessions where we do, you know, 
X amount of efforts um, pushing 15s or all these things. So it does vary a lot. I'm going through a transition now because I'm getting older that I have to bring the intensity down um, and make sure I'm keeping track of when I go intense and when I recover and all these things. But we do a lot of a lot of technical work. Um, so it's slowing, slowing the stroke down. And I like to say you have to learn to walk before you can run. So we break every element of the stroke down and, and you know, we work on the certain drills around that and, and just take time in the water. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I can't, can't share every aspect of my training schedule, but um, the, whole, the whole general consensus is it's quite, quite bipolar training, either very, very slow or very, very fast. I like that bipolar training. <laughs> um, are there athletes that you take inspiration from or, you know, have even gotten information from to, to use from your training, either in swimming or just mm -hmm. in other sports? I mean, we've picked, picked apart different people. Um, my stroke is heavily based on, I guess, my interpretation of uh, Frederick Gousquet. Um his his technical stroke i think he's you know he's got a very very amazing stroke and it's very balanced very beautiful and that was the the motivation when i was starting to go straight arm um of course anthony Evan as well the king of straight arm freestyle and the king of swimming full stop <laughs> um <laughs> we've we have watched these people and try to learn from it um but for me and my 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 working system is you have to feel what's right for you. And it's a very personal uh, connection intrinsically and you have to feel how it works and how it flows. And, and then, yeah, that's kind of more the way it worked. We, we use Fred Biscay as a, as a template, but then it's just been small adaptations for the past six years or so. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, well, Ben, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat with us. It's been great getting no to getting getting to hear all of these thoughts about speed and your training and um, any parting thoughts or anything else before we sign off today. No, I mean, I've, I've got swimming, especially the 50 is, is my life. I have a whole host of thoughts about it and would be happy if more people um, find appreciation for the 50 because I think it's a, a beautiful event and yeah so no but i really appreciate your time as well and interview me so um yeah it was fun fun to share some swimming swimming talk you've been listening to the swim swim podcast stay tuned for new episodes every week you can take swim swim podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel for more videos as well